You know, there's different plateaus in your life that you did what you did, and you look back on it and think, oh, I'm so glad I did it. Hello, everybody. Welcome. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 540, with today's guests, Sensei Fran Vall and Simone Fari. This one's a little bit different. I think you're going to like it. Well, I'm Jeremy Lesniak. I'm your host here for the show. I'm the founder of Whistlekick. And everything we do with this company is in support of the traditional martial arts. If you want to see what that means, go to whistlekick.com. That's where you're going to find everything that we're doing. One of the things that we're doing, we're selling some stuff, raise some funds to keep all this going. And if you use the code PODCAST15, that'll save you 15% off. We've got a bunch of different stuff over there, so check it out. And if you want to check out stuff for this website, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com is the place to go. The goal of the show is to connect, educate, and entertain traditional martial artists throughout the world. If you're up for supporting us, in addition to making a purchase, you could also share an episode, tell somebody about what we're doing, or support the Patreon. P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash whistlekick. Patreon's a place where we post exclusive content, and you get access to it. Some of it, for as little as $2 a month. The more you're willing to contribute, the more we're going to give back to you. Our setup today is a little bit different. Our guest for the show is Sensei Fran Vall. But I'm joined with Simone Fari. Why? Well, because Sensei Fran was the subject of a documentary that Simone put together recently. And it was really hard to talk about how we were going to bring Sensei Fran on and talk about this documentary, as well as her story, which is an amazing story, by the way, without talking about the documentary. And thought, you know what, let's, let's give it some more context. We'll bring Simone on. And that's what we did. It's a great conversation where we unpack an amazing life story that isn't even close to over yet, but it's one that you've got to check out. If you don't come out of this episode feeling inspired, then you probably weren't listening. So here we go. Sensei Fran, Simone, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Thank you. Thank you so much for having us. It's great to be here. It's, it's great to have you. Now, of course, listeners are, are going, wait a second, Jeremy. This is, a, this is a Monday show. This is an interview show. And there are two people. You just introduced two people. What's going on? And yeah, th- this is not typical for us. We don't generally bring multiple people on. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. Well, we, 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 like, to go, we like to go deep. And that doesn't mean we're not going to go deep today. But there's a there's a really good reason that we have both of you on today. And Sensei Fran, I know we're gonna we're gonna talk a lot about your history, but let's let's kind of start a little bit from from the now. And and there's something that we can say about you and your training that most of us cannot say about our training. In that, there's a film about your training. And I'm gonna I'm gonna leave it up to. The two of you to decide who's gonna who's gonna start and and tell how about this whose idea was I it think, and how did that how did that happen i think simone should start because she and her her professional husband also did all this and we it 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 took over about five or six years to put this together oh, wow so i'll let her start because i think that's where it begins sounds good to me thanks simone <laughs> Well, I met Fran several years ago at the College Park um, Judo Club, and it was the more I got to know her, the more um, amazing things I learned that she did. And it was always cool to see her often when the senseis were doing the bow out that all these male senseis would have to bow to Fran at the at the beginning of the line, <laughs> <laughs> uh, little Fran. Um, and you know, first I learned that she was this a very accomplished judo player that everyone looked up to. And then I learned, oh, she also does Naginata. And she's also a dancer. And she's also um, had this amazing career in the Foreign Service. So first it was just this idea that, wow, she's so interesting. I should do a documentary about her. But then as I kind of thought about it more, realized that, you know, there's there's not enough positive portraits of um, strong, accomplished women out there that that would be a contribution. And as I grew a little older myself, I saw there's a special need for <laughs> portraits of um, of older women who who live life vibrantly and make contributions to the world. Um, and then I think, especially in this time, Fran is a person who 
approaches life positively and courageously. And I think that role models of that are particularly needed right now. Um, Fran really believes in making connections with people all over the world. It's a big part of who she is um, and her dedication to martial arts and to and to living life in an engaged, um, community-oriented way, I think is is really something um, we can be inspired by. At least I am, and I hope mm. your, your viewers will be too. I'm, I'm sure they, will. they yeah. will be. I, I, I am. You know, I'm inspired by just the little bit that I got in preparing for this show. So, Sensei Fran, what, what was it like with the idea of someone saying they wanted to make a documentary about you? Whoa. <laughs> well, I thought, really? And then, it, you know, it just picked up and then we just did little segments. We got together, whether it was Naginata or Judo or some dancing. And then she came up to the ski resort where I've been for the last 29 years of uh, skiing and snowboarding. So it all started falling into place. And we just did this in bits and pieces. And it was just, I thought, gee, a documentary. I don't, wow. And you just thing, continue doing what you're doing, and then someone has taken an interest to uh, put it in a documentary. That was pretty overwhelming. But, you know, I just did these things, as, as Simone has said, it's just a lifestyle. It's a way of life. Mm. I have the interest, and I have the energy and the good health, amen to that, to do that. Aside from a few surgeries now and then, you know, sure. as we age, as things go on, that's how it is. Yeah, the thing, one of the reasons I can, it took, I'm sorry, Fran, um, one of the reasons it took so long was because Fran is so busy just to find time to make a connection <laughs> of her. Like you see, even in my um, my summary of the life completely Fran, oh, she does all this um, skiing and snowboarding and she specializes, um, you know, in different um, types of skiers um, too. So yes, yeah, she's got, yes, and I haven't even mentioned all the things that Fran does, but you, <laughs> we've scratched the surface at least. Yeah, it, it, it seems like quite the long list. And, and I'm going to, I'm going to break kind of one of my personal rules here, something that uh, my mother raised me pretty strongly to never do. And, and Sensei Fran, I'm going to ask you your age. I'm going to, and on election day, unfortunately, I'm, I'm, I'll be 82. Okay. That, and by the way, I just voted yesterday and the place I went to vote, there was nobody there. And I took my, my neighbor who was 90 years old because I wanted to take, take her. And, um, that's that's awesome. That's great. It's just her. So we went in and we walked in and out. It was just so delightful. I'm glad we didn't go on the 18th like last Friday, which was the first time. Because mm. Virginia opened up in-person voting last mm. week, last Friday. And I and the, uh, Maryland and, and D.C. are going to follow next month. But it was delightful to walk in, vote, and get out of there. I have, I have no intention of doing this mail thing, which is such a... I, issue now as I, you know I, I don't i don't blame you so i can't handle that <laughs> all the all this else. training that you've done all these different things and 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 as simone mentioned we haven't even really scratched the surface you know you, you both told me some of the things that that you're engaged in and have been for a long time but here i want to i want to start to rewind the clock a little bit because at at 82 and, and pardon me for for putting such a fine point on that there aren't very many women training at that age. And if I'm, if I'm getting my, my context right, you've been training for quite a while. I started judo in 1959 when I lived in <laughs> Wilmington, Delaware. Par pardon me for I laughing started, because that, that's, I think that's. That's the, like 60 years ago. Yeah, that, that's the, the definition of a, a while. Go ahead. Yes. And then it's a lifetime, you know, um, and then Naginata, I was fortunate when I lived in Japan, when I lived in Japan in the foreign service, and I had three assignments, which was fabulous. And when I was in Tokyo from 69 to 72, no, 70 to 72, I started Naginata, which was, I mean, when you start a martial art in the country where it had it originated, it was pretty amazing. And then also in Tokyo, the, the uh, mother school of judo called the Kodokan is there. So needless to say, I was ecstatic because I trained there. And while I was there, I got two promotions, three and just, you know, you're there, you're training all the time. It's like training with God. It's all, all the head senseis, all the amazing um, 
teachers that are there. Now, to back up, really back up, when I first went to Japan, and I was 62 to 65, I was in Sapporo, my favorite part of judo. But I went and I had the occasion to meet Fukuda Sensei in 1965 at the Kodokan. You might know her name. She was a, she's a legend. Got her, her 10th degree while she was alive many years ago. And we had a wonderful party for her for it. And then they were planning her 100th birthday, what, five years ago? And she died two months before her 100th birthday. It was very, it was, it was very um, emotional. P- pardon me for jumping in. She was the first woman to be awarded a 10th don in judo, wasn't she? Oh, my God. It probably will always be. I don't know. Yeah, the 10th. Yes. And she was, uh, it was just such an amazing experience to be there with her when she got it. And, um, you know, in her little humble way she's gone and it's just she was just it's just so inspiring and i worked she we had various men men, uh, several um clinics and workshops with her and i often would be her okay the person you know working with the teacher and she would be teaching and i just felt you know it was so elating to be with someone that high oh it's just i can't you can't talk about it without getting emotional yeah the same thing happened in naginata because I remember being at the one of these schools there in, in it's outside of Osaka, and on one side of me was the soke. A soke in Japanese means, means the head sensei of this art, and on the other side was the other guru who was as it was just. I thought to myself, it's just a very interesting feeling or sensation. I thought if I to die right now, it'd be okay because I'm training with gods, Mm -hmm. godlike people, and they were wonderful. They've all since passed away. And like in everything else, especially in the Naginata, some of the head senseis that I trained with, they were just very personal people. They were just, uh, they were just very much like family to me. And they've all passed away now because I think they were in their eighties. I don't think anybody got to their Mm nineties. So be it. So I, I, I always think, I don't think of myself sometimes as being the sensei when I think of them as the sensei that we are instructors. Do you understand that expression? I do. I do. I, I... There's an, a sensei, there is an instructor. But as you age and as you, I mean, you, you do, your, your body changes. So you, do, you, you uh, address the art in a different way. There's a different insight. There's a different feeling, a different way of approaching and teaching. And it's really helped me to be a better teacher and to be more insightful, just working with people who are coming up or who are, who have also trained all their lives as well. We have people so, from, from all over the world, all ages, all styles. And some of yes. them are likely nodding their heads as you talk about how the art and the expression of the art, the instruction of the art changes as you age. But some of the younger folks might not be wrapping their head around that. I'm wondering if you might be able to Go a little deeper and, and help those younger folks you know, understand. Is, you know, you, you train with different teachers. You train with with different levels of teachers. You train with students as well because you're you're all being you're the student when you're with the heads when the senseis. It just gives you a different a, a, a feeling of understanding of how more of a, of a not only a physical but a um, psychological and just just a historical background of what, 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 where it came from and how they have trained and how hard they had to work at, at where they had, where they had, had they accomplished. And um, now, of course, during this, as you know, during the pandemic, it's, it's even more um, important for us to continue to, um, to work at our martial arts, all of them or wherever we're doing this. As I said to Simone and everybody, I go out every day and to, with Mother Nature, and it gives me a chance to reflect and to um, think about how, how you know how we're approaching this mm. challenge we're in now with this pandemic. For sure, does that all make sense? You, as a martial artist, understand that. Yes, it's something that it's something that. It's also something sometimes you can't really talk about. It's something that's, you, it's something from within. We go out and I say, well, sometimes we'll start doing some ashiwaza, some footwork, some, what you call, just, just movements. Or 
I take my Naginata stick out sometimes and I do some work out there where nobody around thinks I'm losing it out there with my stick. But it's just you're out there doing your thing. It doesn't matter who's watching you and if they want to watch you, that's fine. But it's it's something that's personal that you almost can't talk about, Jeremy. Mm. But you as an artist have done all these other artists, all these budos. Budo is the Japanese word for martial art. Mm -hmm. So um, it's something that's very, it's deep inside. It's something that you really sometimes can't talk about. Does yeah, that make sense? It does to me. I get it. The people listening. It's like whatever you're devoted to, whether it's, it's whether it's your personal work, your profession, or your, your interest in things like that. And that's all very important. Sometimes it's very difficult to talk to people around about this. I just went over to visit a friend of mine on Sunday. I introduced and this. This was a, this is a judo story. There were three girls that I all were roommates at the time. They were all working for the State Department, as I was. And I introduced them to judo. There were three single guys. And I just, and I, you know, I was excited to introduce them to judo, not thinking about being a matchmaker, which I didn't think about. Mm -hmm. And all of them eventually married one of them. This one, fa the one family I did, I went to see the wife, the husband has since died several years ago. And they had, they had six beautiful children and are all very, very much involved and devoted to judo. Right now it's on hold because of the pandemic. But we, we go out and we reminisce. And she, has, she just turned 80 and her, her oldest son did this incredible um, scrapbook and so many pictures and so much. So I went through it and each one had, we had our own page, but she and I reminisce. I knew her parents and her, I knew her family. And just, it was just, it's like an adopted family. And it was, it was so interesting because I would, when I was in the foreign service, I would come back certain times and I would always go over to the Tamais to be with them and to stay with, just to visit with the children. And the kid, those kids grew up doing judo when they could, as soon as they could crawl. Mm. So they've been a devoted and they're, they're, they're like my little, they're like adopted yeah. family. And I take the blame for introducing the mother and father, but what else? <laughs> anyway, it, was, <laughs> it worked out that way. And oh. she's, she's, she's got what, 14 or 15 great grandchildren. Oh, that's wonderful. Grandchildren, no, grandchildren and several great grandchildren. So, you know, it's just, it's a lot, it's just so special. So we have a lot to communicate with. Yeah. about this it yeah. so Carl and we talk about it I talk, yeah. I talk to her all the time because it's very important they're like my adopted family or I've, I've been adopted since I take the blame for introducing mother and dad S Simone it sounded like you were going to say something yeah, so Carl to my um, one of the children she's speaking about she um, she worked with him to become a U.S. champion in Juno Kata Oh, and the kata pro we had. We did a lot. Carl and I competed in three of the three of the seven kata. There are seven katas. We did three of. We competed for what five years, I think. And then his sister, who was in uh, the youngest of his children, Diane, she was in in France for a, a three year job. And, and um, when she came back, she became his partner and doing very well. But he and I did three katas. And the Juno Kata was one of my favorites, but it is probably of the seven, there are seven Katas in Judo. It is the hardest. And the hardest is because the movements are very much unlike, they're harder for men to do because of the stretching and the lifting and, I mean, and the, the arching and things that you have to do that, most, that those bodies cannot always do. Mm. Maybe, women, maybe the women find it easier to perform it. But of the seven Katas, and I have competed in all of them. It is, I think, the hardest because of that, because of the movements. And you can understand that. Can you hear me? But I don't see anybody. Yeah. Yeah. We, all the videos off. Anyway, I, we, we can hear you. you. And, you know, and when you do kata, and, I, and, and we really highly promote kata, it's also in Naginata as well. When you do kata, that's another, it's another form of understanding and insight of what what goes on about your movements and why you do them. And it just, it just has a special, um, it has a special um, reward 
for doing that kind of training. And we do a lot of kata now as all of us are aging because the, they're all getting older. And right. the youngest in our what, early 50s, they're 50. The youngest of the, the six uh, to my children are now 50. But is it, we, and we share a very common um, uh, communication with it, which is very special. And breaking it down, and that's the other thing. If, as you know, Jeremy, if you're breaking down something, I did this in skiing, especially and skiing and snowboarding. I have found that this, the martial arts have helped me teach and be more uh, aware in teaching my on snow activities as opposed and also from, from just because the judo, the, the, the martial arts has helped the skiing and snowboarding or the, or the snow sports and the other has helped me. So I'm, I'm writing an article. I haven't put it down on paper yet. It's going to be called East Meets West Positive Transfer, which means the judo or the, the martial arts have been very helpful in helping me teach the snow sports mm. and the snow sports in reverse. Does that make sense? It does. It does. I, I've spent a little bit of time it really, on really the slopes. Does. I get it. it I, I want to well, go back. I want to I go back because it, th- this is the stuff that, that Simone was, was hinting at when we started this, this idea that you have this laundry list of things that you've done. And so now we just learned that you teach skiing and snowboarding, which uh, that's, that's already blowing my mind because I, <laughs> as someone who lives in Vermont and grew up in New England, I know when snowboarding started and uh, you, you were not terribly young when that started. No, so you, no I think I was in my fifties, <laughs> right. I guess, late fifties. So, you know, I just took it up cause I thought it would be a fun thing to do. But the first time I went out, I can tell you this right now, I felt so much, oh my God, it was like I was kissing the snow every other second. <laughs> my poor coccyx, would, I thought it would never be the same. But I found it a challenge and I, you know, there's different levels and I took a test and passed a test and I probably will never take another test because now when I go out, I don't go out unless somebody's with me. And because, I suspect that this you know, is a as theme. As you get older, you don't want to fall, period. You know, that's how it is. And that's my prerogative not to fall <laughs> I, I agree Ever. but i suspect well, that any this us, is a theme fall, and it's much it's much easier when you get older and I, as i said yesterday when i went out to vote with my 90 year old the 90 year old um neighbor i kept thinking dear god because she was holding on to me and i thought god i hope i don't fall <laughs> <laughs> no i felt very strong with her but you know i thought dear this this dear little lady is holding on to friends so be there for her. You, and you know, I could feel there's this, I have an interesting, when I, when I hold your hand, I have pretty strong hands, I guess, over the t- years for the Naginata and the Judo. So if I hold on to your hand, I hope I don't stop the blood. And I jokingly say that. But, you know, you, you hold on to someone as it's just something that you do. I remember hiking in in, uh, out in California not a couple of years ago when we were down this trail and it was a little place where it was very, it was very, it looked, it looked very uh, challenging. And this gentleman was ahead of me. He said, you want me to take your hand? I said, sure. So I took my hand. He says, gosh, you have a strong grip. I didn't want to tell him I did judo. So I just took his hand, but I could feel the hand tightening on his hand as a feeling of security, of, you know, of stability, I guess. Sure. But, you know, it is, a, you know, I'm happy to say I have a strong body. I just be careful not to fall. And I, it's, it's the main thing most people think about as they get older. Right. As we, as you say. Right. Let's, let's go back to when you were, when you were younger though. There, there's, there's a, there's a place that I want to get to with this, because I, I think there's something that the audience is going to really appreciate if we dig in. You said you started in 1959. Yeah, I was very athletic also okay. in growing up and also in high school belonged to this athletic club or whatever it is. You do these things because it was, I was, my mother was not really an athlete. She was a runner, I think, as a, as a younger person, but that's it. My dad was not, not though I know of. He was just a very hard worker and grew up in very difficult times. My sister wasn't too much of a... Of a uh, she did. She. I don't think she had her own thing, but she didn't do much. Nothing. Nothing in Budo, though. 
but there weren't anyway. very many women getting started in martial arts, at least in the United oh, that's States. Very, that's very, very back true. Then. That's so, very true. so here, here's where I want to get. Let, bear with me as kind of a kind of a two part thing. There, there, there was something about your personality in 1959 that that made you say, "Hey, not only is this something I'm interested in when culturally it's not something most women are doing, but it's so male dominated. But I don't care, and I'm going to charge through this." Did that at all you know, come never, down from yeah. from your parents, from your mother? Was there some inspiration there that set the tone? Yes, yes, yes. See, I never thought about. I, 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 um, I started this judo class because my mother thought that I should learn self-defense. This is a 1959, Jeremy. And she said, this is how I started. She wanted me to take a course at the YMCA in uh, um, self-defense. And I said, what's self-defense? I mean, dear God, that in those days, that was just, just something they never thought about. I'll talk about it. Now it's, I mean... We, we live in that, in, in that environment. So I did what mother told me to do. I was good, o- obedient child. I took the class. For t- I was there only in it for two weeks. And that's when I um, unknowingly had been introduced to going to st- taking, working for the, in the foreign service for the state department and went down to the, the, the ladies, the YWCA and took the test and got interviewed and blah, 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 and got hired. And I went, uh, that's how I went down to Washington. The friend I went with and who took me, that, who introduced me to all this thing of this, at the YM, YWCA, she decided not to and she got married and had a family. Well, that's how I got down to Washington, D.C. And by, I was very lucky, got introduced to Jim Takamori, who was a namesake in judo, who passed away five years ago. Um, so that's how I started judo, and I was extremely devoted to it. I think I trained four or five days a week. So, you know, there it was. Mm. And that's just how it started. So it became a lifestyle. And, a, and it is, it has to be a lifestyle and a very, very de- definite a dedication. And you just do it. And I didn't think about it. And then when I got, I stayed in Washington purposely because I wasn't, I wanted to get introduced to the State Department and see how it worked. And it was very, very helpful and very insightful. And when I got assigned to Japan, I was ecstatic. To oh, that was, that was just luck. Business. That wasn't a choice. Yeah. Well, I asked for Japan okay. and I had no idea what who, Sapporo, where Sapporo and became, I mean, I, I almost wanted to, I would, I would have retired there in a heartbeat. But at the time, and as you know, the, the yen to the dollar was really bad at the time. And I thought, you know, if I depend on, on a, 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 you know, I would have probably worked there and taught English, which everybody does in Japan. And I would have stayed there and I could have continued my naginata and my judo and everything else. But I found a, a, the, head se- the head sensei in all of Hokkaido, Hokkaido is the island there, the, 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 the dor- northernmost island. I, I got introduced to him and he, he, he just adopted me like in all in his dojo. His dojo was in his home. And I just became part of the family type thing and trained with him. And at the time who was living, one of the other senseis, who was what, in his 70s at the time. I was what, 23. And I just fell in love with Japan because I got so involved in it. And I did, and Hokkaido, of course, the ski country, and that's where I started really think seriously skiing. There it was wonderful and going. It was just, it it was it was just a wonderful um, experience. I was only there two uh, two years or so, and I should have stayed more. But I, then I was luckily got two more assignments in Japan in my course, and I think it has to do with the fact that I was in hardship posts. But one of my claims to fame in the Foreign Service was Afghanistan for three and a half years from 72 to 75. And one of the things I did there, which was really wonderful, is that they had an an international school there. And I started a kid's class. I think I about had 30 30 children. It was so exciting and so wonderful because it gave, there was not a lot to do in Afghanistan. Besides, we had a, our group, we, start, we formed a hiking group, which we did. And we had an uh, a, uh, amateur theater group. 
But this in, this kids class was so much fun, and the parents were thrilled because it gave their kids something constructive to do. To a couple times a week, and I took I went to a local tailor, and he made their little judo gis and their obis, their little belts for two bucks. So it was a big, it was a big um, income for them for them. So I was very happy about that. I wanted to do a, 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 a an adult class. But I don't think they would be interested. And that's a lot more, that's harder to do with kids. You can just have a good time. It's a different approach to teaching. But I thought it was more of a contribution for the children. And, and then also what they had in Afghanistan, they had a, a, the Germans had a school from zero, from uh, zero, from kindergarten to eighth grade. And I had a judo class there. Now my German was next to nothing at the time. And one of the kids, the 11 year old kid who would help translate. So I started picking up and learning some German and I taught judo there and they were very receptive and they had a very lovely school there. They also had a, a small commissary, which I had privilege to use. It was really exciting, although it was it was just a wonderful experience. So, so you know, one 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 door opens and it, it does uh, doors open all the time. So my my love and everything for judo continued, especially in Sapporo, with my teacher. They were just they were a family, and then after the sensei passed away, I had gone back to judo, back to Sapporo on several occasions, and just stayed with the family. Now the wife and the daughter speak very little English. The the daughter speaks more English because she's younger. She, if she couldn't couldn't get the words or whatever, we had dictionaries. You know, they have those little computers. You put the word in English, it comes back in Japanese, or in Japanese, mm -hmm. and it comes back in English. It was pretty incredible. So I went back in two thousand in May of two thousand seventeen, because they were tearing down the house they lived in. I guess was bought by the government, and they were tearing the whole thing down. So it was really emotional they have moved into what they call a man a mansion a mansion in japanese is an apartment building and um i i will probably when i ever go back to Sapporo, i will not go back to that place because i couldn't back go back to that location and see it's probably been they probably put up a a condo like they do here in america everything probably puts up another construction mm -hmm. So going back to Sapporo is very special to me. Kobe is another very special place to me too. So or Japan in general, because there's so many memories and, and I still have all these people that I try to keep in touch with and write to. Mm. I, I want to pass the ball over to, to Simone for a moment. So, you know, we, we we're starting to get this, this amazing life story here. And I'm, I'm curious when did you realize that the path that Sensei Fran had followed was was so atypical that it warranted telling this story? It was a gradual process, but I realized just hearing Fran's um, response and your question that way before Nike wanted to trademark just do it, Fran was a just do it person. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, that's, you know, Simone, I often think of that expression, just do it. I mean, I think that's such a great expression. Just do it. It is. Just do it. Yeah. That's a very, I yeah. love that. It's, yeah, it's a very good motto. Yeah, and a way, you know, there's not one little canned answer to, you know, why Fran does what she does and one can't answer to why there was not one moment like, okay, this is it. I have to make this document. You kind of are called to things in life. Um, I don't know if that sounds maybe too spiritual for some people, but <laughs> not for me, I, I get yeah, it. Yeah. I mean, there's some things that are just a natural fit and you were meant to do. And I kind of felt like for whatever reason, I was meant to do this documentary and friend, you know, inspires me in her openness to new experiences, you know, to being, aware of you know what is interesting and where she can you know have a role and, and play a part it's you know another thing i must insert here if i may is that having been Please. in the foreign service and loved, loved all over the world and you interact with all people from all over the world living here in this area is very much like being in the foreign service because as you know in washington dc 
every country is represented here with their embassy. So I never feel far enough, far from being in the foreign service. You understand what I mean by that? Yeah. Why did you I mean, choose the foreign service? So East meets West, it's not, it's very not uncommon to walk down the street and hear three or four languages. Sure. So well, you pick up, I can now say thank you in 10 languages and happy birthday in seven. <laughs> I just learned That's how awesome. to say happy, oh, happy birthday in Vietnamese. Don't ask me to say it. I have it written down. I have to go study it to do, say it. And when I said happy birthday to the 90 year old who just turned on you last month, she actually understood me. She's she, and she, I was very happy. So I wrote it down phonetically. <laughs> and now I can say happy birthday in Vietnamese. That's <laughs> yeah. cool. What, what, what I was saying, sorry. yeah, about um, the the mix of cultures and people. I think I really saw that on the mat too at the dojo, and I think it's so important that in in the martial arts, it's one of those cultures where people from all kinds of different not only really cultural backgrounds Absolutely. but political opinions um, can come together and just share something and be friends and we need more spaces like that so i just want to encourage people who are struggling to continue with their martial arts to to try because i think in a country that becomes you know it's becoming more divided and differences are more clear to be you know able to work together like that is um is important especially now doing yeah. this election and everything else yes thank you yeah, yeah for sure yeah what prompted the foreign service we, we, well, no, we kind of just, jumped over the why on that. Well, my friend introduced me, and I, I was totally oblivious because I was going to business. I was just finishing business college at the time. So I had just finished it. So this was a, an opportunity. And I thought, oh, my God, I'm going to, I'll do that. And, and for my parents, I, you know, I was going to move to Washington. Oh, my God, she's leaving home. Well, my sister was still there, of course. But, and I went down, my, I had a father, my dear dad was a little nervous Nelly whenever I did anything. And if I ever drove back and forth to, from Washington to DC, from Washington to Wilmington. But I mean, they accepted the fact that I was gonna leave home and go down to Washington DC. But then after three and a half years there, three years there, and I said, um, that's also when I work, I also worked for the Red Cross down there too, which was very, a wonderful start to my interest in in, in, in that kind of volunteering. Anyway, I, I realized that, um, I don't know, I forgot, I've lost my train of thought. So let me think. That's okay. So, that's, all, that's all right. Anyway, so that's how I got into, I mean, I got into foreign service, but and then, and then I decided, because I went into the foreign service, it means you go overseas, but I chose not to go into the foreign, overseas right away because I wanted to get a feeling for working at the State Department, which I did, which was very, very helpful. I got great contacts and, and by the grace of God, I was able to go to Japan, especially thinking about judo and that just reinforced it. My God, how, how lucky am I? And that's just, <laughs> for sure. it just took off. And maybe it wasn't something that I planned. It just fell into place, which I think is sometimes things work out better that way that you don't plan. It just by happenstance or whatever you call it. You know mm -hmm. how that is. I do. Now, one of the things I've learned from folks who have made documentaries, we've had others on the show who've mm -hmm. made documentaries. I have a number of friends who've made non-martial arts documentaries and I've had conversations with them. And one of the things I've learned is that they, they seem to always take much longer and require much more effort than anyone imagines. Was that true of this one as well? Absolutely, <laughs> yes, <laughs> a very true remark. Um, yes, um, part of it was just, yes, getting on friend's schedule takes <laughs> some time. Um, I can't but, imagine there's a lot of free time no. <laughs> in there to, to <laughs> yeah, think just, she's busier than, Sensei Fran, I think you are busier than I am and I am the busiest person I know. So I that blows my mind. Know. You know, Jeremy, I don't think about it as being busy. I mean, I am, and others have told me that, but it's a lifestyle. It's a way of life. That you're not doing judo today, or, or you're not doing nagi nata, you're not dancing. And I do volunteering too. That's really important. So I volunteered uh, a couple places here. We have a place called Wolf Trap, which is a summer theater 
show. And I did that for 25 years, but we didn't do it this year, of course. And then I also work at Arena Stage, which is a very well-known place here, which is also on hold now. But it's nice, and that's another place where you interact and, oh, my God, especially at Wolf Trap. We have a very, very, because of the, all the, in, the uh, embassies and stuff here, we have a very large foreign community here. So it's just, and it's the same thing at, Wolf, at, at, at Whitetail. I mean, I could speak 10 languages up there in one day if, you know, we have Europeans and there's a very large uh, Asian community. A lot of uh, Chinese and Koreans come up there. So I've learned to speak, greet them. I can always say Happy New Year to them too. And it's lovely to meet them and their kids because their children who are growing up here obviously speak their mother tongue at home, which is important, but they also, they're learning English because they're growing up here. So it's lovely to say thank you or hi, happy you. How are you in Greek? I can still say that. The point is, is um, it's just so, re it's refreshing to be in that environment. And we live in that definite environment now. I mean, here in this area, and I feel very sure. comfortable here. Almost like being still like in the foreign service because as I said, East meets West here all the time. Just, and that it's is. a lovely feeling. Yeah, and that actually for the documentary was a, um, it was a blessing and, and, a, and a, I won't say a burden, but so Fran, like, you know, she's so busy living life. Um, she did take these pictures, but for, you know, a few years she would just say, no, I didn't really, you know, take pictures. Um, and then one day she said, I think I have some slides somewhere. And you went, <laughs> and I thought, I was thinking you had a box or two. I said, okay, let's go to get, um, let's go see Ten these, boxes. you know, boxes. <laughs> yeah, and yeah, so you came out of your apartment with like 10 giant produce boxes of slides. <laughs> and fortunately, it was a treasure. Fortunately, I, I, did, I, did, I did my duty and I typed little labels on everything. Oh, yes. Yeah. So the, yeah. So the first three, you know, years of this, I thought I didn't really have any images of her, her foreign service. And then I found out she had beautiful images because she was a great photographer, very good um, sense of composition. Um, but yes, then oh. to sort through those and figure out, you know, what what ones could contribute to the story was a challenge, too, because the, like we said she's done so much, but it didn't necessarily um, help move the movie forward. So a lot of great slides didn't make it to the, to the documentary. Well, and you then, know, uh, at the time I was doing photography, it had to change for the, the close-ups, the wide angle, and blah, blah, blah. Now you just push a button, it does everything. But that was, it was, you know, and I, I would took a lot of time to take my pictures and do composition because there's so much out there. Oh, my goodness. You know that. As a Yeah, as a, I mean, you can really see you in know print. That, yes. <laughs> yeah, and, and the, there's a lot of love in those photos, um, you know, that she... She's fascinated, interested by so many things in the world, and um, and also the the pictures of people that she took there. Uh, you can see she can establish r rapport of people in them, and yes, yeah, so eventually kind of is able to pull this documentary off, and then the um, the whole other project of getting the word out about it came, and so I really appreciate this opportunity to help um, get the word out about uh, Fran's story, which I think you know from its festival experience and and other um, venues I've seen that it can inspire people, so. Um, how, how did you come up with the name? Um, it was something I heard. <laughs> it's a I, great I heard, name. Yeah, it, I heard her tell It seems that, so appropriate. Yeah, I heard um, her tell that story, so I had, before, so I had her tell that on camera. And unfortunately now it's become a bit of an issue because Amazon thinks that name is controversial and has rejected mm. the title. Mm. So I may have to resubmit it to Amazon with. Sensei Frank kicks A asterisk asterisk. <laughs> um, well, you yeah, know, Jeremy, I, I originally said, well, Matt, can you say Sensei Frank kick, kicks tush? Is that, <laughs> that, that, I mean, people know what tush is, I guess, or I don't know. It, I, anyway. I don't know that a lot of the younger, I mean, I, I, I understand tush because of my heritage, but I not understand. everyone's going to, going to, going to get the, the lineage or, or the use of that. I mean, I, the, the home I grew up in, tush was used much more often than butt. Are you, is your background Jewish also? Yes. Yeah. I understand. So I can say Lashana Tova to you. you. You sure can. And thank you. And, and 
to you? <laughs> well, I don't know. Everything is Zoom now. I can't even go to go to a temple now for the services, and I'm not a Zoom. I mean, we're Zooming now, but I just, it needs a lot to be desired, that's for sure. Anyway, here we are. Have, have you, have you had a day where you've had three, four, maybe even six or seven Zoom calls? I call it Zoom Lash. Zoom Lash? <laughs> well, I'm learning how to do Zoom now. I mean, you know, now that I finally into the 21st century and have my own little computer here, it's so exciting. <laughs> Based on your track record, give it six months and you'll have invented the successor to Zoom that'll be three oh, times better know. in every way. I don't want to get too too professional with this thing. <laughs> <laughs> it's just nice to keep in touch and get, get, be able to get a... Because I was using the library a lot. Well, the library is sort of closed down for the rest of the year because they're... I mean, I think you can take you can take out books or put in, you know, you can rent books out and all that stuff, but I don't worry about the, the library anymore because I don't need it, but it's just something that a lot of seniors do use because of the computer system, because of their computers. Yeah. And a lot of people oh still go there to do that when it's, it's open. But the one nearest to me is doing a huge reconstruction, rebuilding thing, and they won't be open until next year, when and if, who knows. I, I want to talk about something that, that you've mentioned a couple of times, Sensei, you, 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 Describe martial arts as a lifestyle, Budo as a, as a lifestyle. It has and to be. Right. The, the, and, and, that, and that's something that's, that's really interesting to me is that you followed up that statement with that statement, lifestyle, and it has to be. And I'm wondering if you'd unpack that a little bit for us. If I what? It, just uh, expand on that. that that's, that's a well, statement that I, I've never heard anyone else make. I've heard it can be, or maybe well, it I should so. be. For, for I've never heard it has because... to be. It's, uh, uh, I'm dedicated, I mean, I go to judo three days, a week, at least three days a week. In the wintertime, I only go where, I, where we have a lot of kids. That's their college park where I first met Simone and her lovely, her little boys. But, you know, it's something that you just do because it's, uh, for, as I said, it's a lifestyle. And I think it's something that has to be habitual that you do because it's important in your life and you're making a contribution because now you reach a point in your life when you're not going to be able to, I can't do, I don't do Shi'i anymore, which is the fighting, but the kata is really big and I can, I can do that. I can teach it. And it, um, it has to be something. It's a, it's a dedication. It's almost something, Jeremy, that you can't talk about. It's just something that's, it's, it's your. It's part of your life. Your your daily life. Does that make sense? You're doing Budo. You understand. I do. I do. Now, Simone, when any any director, anybody who makes a film, anybody who creates any kind of art, creative endeavor, etc., there's a decision and and many decisions in how to represent that. How did you go about trying to portray? this incredibly varied layered story that is sensei fran well in bits know, and pieces the, <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's a gradual process of discovery and but because film is a visual medium you kind of look for you know how can you show the story rather than than tell it um I wanted 20 minutes even though i had to you know leave a lot of what fran was out there just because i think that's a a good um, length that people can get a taste of her story and then also discuss it and, um, and think through. And at one point, I kind of wanted to go through her kind of um, different aspects of her philosophy. Um, and I think you do see that in the film still, her, her value of making connections with people, um, her approach to diet, um, also just living simply and um, focusing on connections, focusing on on action, doing what you um, what calls to you to to be done, um, to contribute, to teach, to, and to use teaching as a way to contribute to others and the betterment of others. Mm. Those are all kinds of themes I wanted to explore when I did it. And she she has a saying which I, I'm surprised it hasn't come up now. You say we had a nice exchange, and she used to say that a lot. At, and for her, you know, this exchange between cultures um, where you, you maybe teach something, but you also learn something about a culture, too, is a, 
another kind of key value to her that I, I wanted, that I hope comes through in the documentary. I forgot that, wanna... you're right. <laughs> <laughs> Where would people find the documentary? Great. Um, they go to the film's website, senseifriend.com. You can rent it there. Um, you can stream it or buy a DVD. And you can also contact me if you have more questions or you know somebody else who ought to be the subject of a documentary. I'd love to hear from you. Oh, you may have just opened up a door. <laughs> <laughs> there when are first, some... when, when this yeah, first came ahead. out, I was totally oblivious. I never heard the word trailer, that there was a trailer out. Mm. And I thought, you know, the only trailer I know of as a trailer is a trailer trailer. <laughs> well, I learned a new word. I know, I, you know. You, you thought they were going to hook you to the back of a truck and well, drive you around. Well, that's what I thought. So some promote some the, kind the of film a, that way. <laughs> an RV or something. I don't know. <laughs> well, yeah. anyway, now I know what a trailer is. Duh. Yeah, <laughs> that's a good point. You can watch the trailer on the website or you can watch the whole film as well. Mm. And you it's mentioned that this minutes. is... And you mentioned that this has been at festivals and it's, it's been received well. Yes, it has. Um, unfortunately, um, the festivals now are online, but when we do even virtual Q&As. Um, First place in some get, places, too. Uh, in, Lynn, in London. What's that? Yes, it was at a film festival in London, the Fighting Spirit Martial Arts Festival. Um, won Best Documentary there. Oh, cool. Yeah, so yes, it's been, um, it's been well received. It's... Um, of course, you know, no film is going to please everybody, but I think a lot of people have been just inspired by Fran. I remember we showed it um, at a local screening and really the young man came up and he said, you know, I was kind of too scared to try um, rollerblading. I thought I wanted to do it, but I was too scared. And now do I've it. seen Fran, I'm going to try rollerblading. Yes. yes. <laughs> Let's go together. I still have my rollerblades. Absolutely. Do it. Do it. <laughs> I'll be, de- I'll be, I'll be, de- I certainly will take out my hiking sticks to do it now because I don't want to fall. <laughs> Just <laughs> do it. Just do it. Do it along a fence where you can hold on so you won't fall. <laughs> I, I think I know the answer to this question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Go ahead. Is there anything that you didn't try, didn't do that you regret? Oh, there's a couple some places I didn't, um, some traveling that I didn't do earlier and I wish I had, but basically I'm glad I did what I did. But I look back on in the foreign service, especially, especially when I was in Afghanistan, because it was such a, it was the time to be there from 72 to 75 before everything fell apart and they started bombing whatever they did in 78. But and when I, last year, uh, we had a big international world championship of Naginata in Wiesbaden, Germany. And I went along as part of a support team for, for the, for the um, American team. And some of my friends that I still stay in touch with who I knew in Afghanistan, one family, the husband was with um, Siemens. And I visited them and spent time with them and their kids. Well, their children are all now, one is an architect, one is uh, an anesthesiologist. And we had such a wonderful, oh my God, great exchange. And the anesthesiologist is is a doer. She goes hiking and all this kind of stuff. And we did some great hiking together. The point is, we both said, the husband and I, we left, in, I left to the end of 75 and they left the same time. They had been there longer. He was there for a long, he was, he's a, a, a uh, engineer. It was, we were there at the time and we left at the time. So we were very fortunate to be there when we were there. I just can, oh, it was just, it, it's just, it was just heart wrenching to see when things started falling apart. And when I was mm-hmm. there in, in July of 1970, in see, 70, 73, is when they had the coup. So we were very, very fortunate as foreigners not to have to pack up as much as we could carry and leave like they did in Vietnam. And we were very, the only thing we had is a, we had a curfew to be in at nine o'clock, and that wasn't a hard thing to do. But the whole, the whole premise is here is that there are times to be places. You are when you are, there is the time to be there. So when I was with the family and spending time with them, they live up in, in another part of Germany and we just spent a great a week together. It was just reminiscing and thanking, our, and thanking ourselves that we were 
how lucky and knowing how our, to ourselves how lucky we were to have been there at the time. And we traveled in country which you could not do without getting permission and having the, you know, you know, God signed you off to go and travel because everybody heard of Bamiyan, yeah. which is the course where they found his um, statues. But we went to Bandamir. Bandamir was the, the, the one of the wonders of the world. Seven lakes, handmade, oh, they're just natural lakes. And we went there a couple of times. I actually swam in one of the lakes, I almost froze to death. It was like, it was freezing <laughs> cold. Anyway, the point is, and they allowed these French professional photographers to go there and do a documentary. I have a fabulous book on, on I, think, I think I can still find it, that it's done by the French. The, all the, well, you, you speak French, um, Simon, so the first part yes. of it is all in French, but then it's all photography, total, just pictures. And you know, a picture's worth a thousand words. You do not need to have anything underneath it. If I can find it again. So I think the point is, yeah. If I can find so I it, think the, the point get. though is that, yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, I think the point is Fran has so many memories now of all the things she did do and the people she did meet that there probably isn't any time for regrets about things she didn't I do. I don't regret, but I do. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool I can hear that. And do it, you know, don't put it, the other thing is, if you if you can, sometimes you do what you do and think, oh, thank God I did it then because I couldn't do it now type thing or you wouldn't do it now type thing. You know, there's, diff you're, there's different plateaus in your life that you did what you did and you look back on it and think, oh, I'm so glad I did it then. I wish, you know, not, not woulda, shoulda, coulda, but there are other things I could have done more, but you know, I'm just glad I did what I did. So now I'm taking off and I can still challenge myself. I don't think about the age. It's a question of being able to travel again to do it. So we'll see. Mm. And safety but and all that good let's, stuff. Yeah, let, let's look forward. Let's look into the future. Let's you know, put pandemic aside. Let's assume whatever period of time we're about to talk about, there are no restrictions. No, I want, what do you, you know, want I want to do to... what's what are you going to put on the list? And, and this is a question for both of you, because you're, you're, you're you know, you're you're both here. You, we're, we're talking. We're primarily talking about Sensei Fran. But I would I, I can't imagine, Simone, that in doing this work. Your life hasn't been changed, that to work this intimately with Sensei Fran hasn't had some impact on you and the way you look at the world. So. We'll, we'll start with Sensei Friend. I remember where, Simone came up. Where do you want to go? What do you want to do? Well, I know Simone came up and she, she I don't think she had ever skied before. Maybe she did. She took, we took, took a lesson. I felt so honored to, to give her a lesson in skiing. Do you remember that, came out, Simone? Nice. I did. It was fun. I mostly stayed upright, too. You did. You didn't <laughs> fall. Well, the, you know, it's just, you know, it's so interesting because, as I said, you could, you, 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 when you're teaching one thing, there are certain things in judo that might come out when you're skiing. So one of my, one of, this, I have to insert this, one of my colleagues, she and um, her husband came up for their fifth wedding anniversary and took a snowboard lesson. So when you fall in judo, there's a certain way to fall. And that's how she fell on the snow and it was perfect. But when she fell backwards, that's something else. I mean, you know, when we, you, she, oh no, she, I, I think she tried to do it. With a, with a snowboard on both feet are attached, so it's hard, but she did. And you have to be careful that you don't hurt yourself with falling your tush, which everybody does. But the idea is, you know, there's, it's called, tran you know, you also have transfer learning. So one thing works for the other. I, I don't know, thinking ahead, there's some other traveling I want to do. I still want to go visit these friends that I know that are in California. Uh, overseas, I want to go back to Japan really badly to visit some of these friends I haven't seen since I left Kobe. And I know I've, we've lost some of them already that have passed, but I want to visit their families. And that's one of my things I definitely want to do. And I will do it. I mean, this eventually- I have no doubt. I don't no think doubt anyone listening do would doubt allow anything. I us to go and I don't have to quarantine myself. But I would quarantine myself anyway instead, you know, I don't want to have to, you know, it's just, I'm going back to Japan, I feel so, I just feel comfortable. And I often think, you know, because of the different languages I have spoken or have studied, I often think in that language. And sometimes when I get really upset, 
instead of saying something nasty in English, look, I can think of it in the foreign co- language so people don't think it, they have no idea what I'm saying. And if they do, I don't care I like because it. it's like, I don't drive anymore and it's okay because I just can't handle the impatience and the, the rudeness out there. But sometimes they just have to be scolded. It's just awful. And it's just, and I think, and so I definitely want to go back to Japan. I definitely want to spend some time there with which, who is the families that are still alive and well. And I belong to a really fun hiking group when I was in Kobe. And one of the main guys who we did, oh, so I just saw some wonderful pictures on, I have a bunch of stuff I'm saving for you, Simone, when we get together so you can reminisce through some of the stuff I never found when we were doing this documentary. But anyway, I want to go back to this to see this family. The head guy who did the hiking and I want to see the I want to visit all these people that are still alive. We did Mount Fuji together. It was absolutely wonderful. It was, it was five of us, four of the guys and Fran. <laughs> just so it was just so fun. The head guy who did led most of it who at tender age of 45 died from some kind of cancer. I don't remember. But anyway, I definitely want to go back. Those memories are so deeply rooted or so embedded into my past that, you know, it's hard to talk about it without getting emotional. But I get emotional easily. <laughs> anyway, and there's some other hikings and things I want to do. I didn't. I wanted to do Kalimanjaro, but I never did it. So I might want to try that again. Mm-hmm. Not again, but that. Mount Fuji, I did mm-hmm. one and a half times. I say one and three quarter times because the first time we went, th- I went there. They had the, the you know the fog. When a fog comes, you cannot, you're not allowed to hike. When we got to the ninth station. There are ten stations, and it would have taken a it would take sometimes a week to get the fog to go down. So the second time, I went back with my hiking buddies, and there's some other hiking I want to do. And you know. Um, I still, I learned how to do, uh, for a while I was studying sign language and I want to get back to doing more sign language because it's so helpful to you. It's another challenge to my to-do list, to keep up list. The most important thing is to, for all of you to know is that I just want to stay healthy as long as I live. My, my Nagi Nata said something, they gave me a big party several years ago and they said, you're going to leave, to live, live at least to be 100. I said, that would be very nice. But I want to be as healthy as long as I live. Amen to that. And then you can do, when you have your health, you have every, you have your wealth. So there you are. I agree. Challenge. And There's always Simone, something how- to challenge yourself. But I think the most, the biggest challenge and the biggest prayers is to stay healthy and well, staying healthy as long as we live, because you don't do anything without it. Totally. Yes, Simone, how, how about you? What, what kind of a two-parter here, you know, what, what's coming in the future for you and how has this process, this documentary changed your life? Um, well, I would love to tag along with Fran on her trip to Japan someday. <laughs> that would be awesome. <laughs> have, you ever been, have you ever been to Japan? No, I haven't. Oh. I think you would be the perfect guy to do that. So maybe we can do that someday. Oh my God, that that would be perfect. All right, let's put that on our to do list. Okay, sounds like a plan. <laughs> um, I'd also like to make other documentaries about um, seniors like Fran who are role models. I get the feeling that there are a lot more people out there that you know are not celebrities, but that we should know more about that are good role models for us um, as we age. And that's, um, if anybody out there knows of somebody, I would love to hear about that. You can use my website, senseifran.com to um, reach out to me and let me know. Um, and yes, I also, I yes, I also wanna keep doing what Fran does, which has inspired me to do, which is keep traveling, keep getting to know other cultures better and making connections with other people throughout the world. Um, and to live a kind of simple, focused life like she does. Sounds like a great way. How about you, Jeremy? Very, uh, what are your goals? Keep doing this show. Keep keep growing Whistle Kick and connecting with and training as many martial artists as I can. May I, may a, I ask uh, you, Jeremy, how, first, how, what, please. what is your age? 
I'm 41. Oh my God. You're just getting started, <laughs> Matt, a, my dear. I, I feel like that. I really do. You're on your uh, way. <laughs> last week at Taekwondo, the, we, we were doing some drills and, and the instructor kind of generalized a couple of us and, and said, ah, oh, kids. And I had to remind him my age. I don't consider myself a kid, but most of the time I feel like one and I'm, I'm okay with that. Jeremy, you should give me your contact because I know I'll be coming up to Vermont to ski again. We can't do this. Oh, uh, this yeah. would be in December because that's when we had the program this in December. But of course, because of this pandemic, everything is dead. So yeah. it would be, yeah, and we we'll usually go either to I... Killington or Mount Snow. Oh, Killington's uh, about an hour for me. Mount Snow's a little further, but I'd make the trek. That would Not be that so fun. We could take each other to dinner. <laughs> I, I'm game. You I'm can game. take Let's a lesson. Oh no! You, well, I don't, do you ski or snowboard? I do. I do. I'm. I'm not. A, I'm not a great skier, but I am a competent skier. That's okay. It's all right. You know, the last time, not last year, two years ago, when I was up in Vermont, we had the pro jam. I, I I did something which I have never done before. I skied with the senior group. Okay. Well, most people are in senior groups now, anyway. <laughs> but the old. This was so incredible. The oldest guy in our group was 92. I mean, dear God, I thought like one of the kids on the block. And I remember when we walked up and had a hike up a little hill, he, um, this, the instructor carried his skis. And I thought, dear God, he's alive, breathing, and he's a, he was a very good skier. His son was with us, who was also a very good skier. But it was just the whole idea of being in that presence. He was the oldest. The next was 86, and then there was Fran. And then a couple other 70-year-old kids or something or whatever. <laughs> but one of the women had, oh, she had what did she had some condition, so she couldn't ski all day. It was just mm. interesting. And how this was a, that's another interesting thing, how the instructors who taught the senior group had to teach according to their ability and to what they could do and to what level they could do. This 92-year-old, my God, he, he just hung, he was just incredible. I mean, I didn't think of, of an age. We were just a group. And we got along really, really well. We just, just, we just did. It was just so, it was very, it was very special. It was, it wasn't an age thing, but it was something I noticed. It was just so, oh gosh. And then one of the guys who I, well, they always have a big dan a dinner or banquet and they have dancing. And one of the guys who I always used to dance with was up there. I hadn't been up and hadn't seen him. He says, can you still dance? I said, does a, does a frog hop? Yes, of course. So we danced. And we had, yes, because I grew up in the 50s doing jitterbug and all that stuff. But anyway, the point is, is that, um, I mean, I forgot my train of thought again. Anyway, That's so okay. keep on going, That's Jeremy. Okay. Keep doing so. It would be great. I mean, we have different goals now in our lives, but as we age, these goals can change. But that doesn't mean I'm not going to... I will always go back to Japan sometime, and especially to Sapporo. That's my first love, as I told you. But also the... And we could go... Oh, I could take you to these these martial arts, these classes with me to the Kodokan in, in Tokyo, and especially to Naginata. You would be so excited to do this. Simone, it would be such an insight to the country. I, Sounds great. Well, the most not, not only do the I, most I, important I, place you have to visit whenever you go to Japan is the 100 yen shop. It is phenomenal. The quality of stuff is far and above what we have at our dollar stores. Absolutely. But <laughs> I'm telling you, it really is. Sounds but, far more fun, yes, too. Yes, it is. And I, it, one of my favorite things to do in Sapporo they have a, it's called Daizu, and Daizu is a hundred yen shop. It is five floors, five floors. <laughs> First floor is snacks wow. and drinks and blah, blah, blah. Then you have the kitchen and the dine and, and, the, and the office and you have, oh my God, it's just phenomenal. I mean, I've spent hours there and everything is a hundred yen. hundred yen is about a dollar 10 now because they now have taxes. So you can buy up, oh, oh my God, it's phenomenal. So, Sarah, so we'll put that on the top of our list, Simon. <laughs> and like and I, I hope you take a lot of photos when this trip happens, I and I hope that you'll, you'll reach back out will. because we would, we, we've, we've got to let everybody know, you know, the follow-up 
on on this conversation <laughs> because th this is this has been a lot of fun. So I want to, um, I really appreciate you both being here. It's been a good conversation. I have no doubt that if we continued this conversation longer, we would have found more and more and more amazing things in Sensei Fran's life. What I think we got out of today was a snapshot, a profile of the mindset of someone who is living life to the fullest. And that's a cliche. We've heard that statement so many times, live life to the fullest. How many people actually embody it? Well, today we heard from one of them. And more so, I think it's pretty clear how martial arts can be a thread that weaves through that well-embodied life and lifestyle. Further, sharing this story in such a powerful way as this documentary, I think not only serves to better the world, but it furthers a lot of my personal goals. So it was a no-brainer to have these two on the show. I want to thank you, Sensei Fran. I want to thank you, Simone, for coming on the show, for doing what you've done and what you will continue to do. I am not lying when I say I feel energized and excited about life even more after talking to the two of you today. If you want to check out the stuff we talked about, the links, photos, maybe check out some social media, get some transcripts for some episodes, go to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. You can check out everything we got over there, all the episodes we've ever done, sign up for the newsletter. There's a bunch for you to check out. If you haven't been there in a while, do it. And remember, if you want to support us, you've got a lot of ways you can do so. You can use the code PODCAST15 to get 15% off at whistlekick.com. You could also consider buying one of our books on Amazon, telling others about the show, or supporting us via the Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com slash whistlekick. If you see somebody out there wearing something with a whistle kick on it, say hello. Maybe strike up a conversation about martial arts. If you've got guest suggestions or other feedback, I want to hear it. Email me, jeremy at whistlekick.com. I'm going to leave you for now. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.